begin a series today entitled Construction Zone. Construction Zone. I tried to go in a different direction, I'll be honest with you. I had something that was already written out. It was about six weeks of, uh, of a series, and I kept looking back going, I can make this work, I can make this work. And the Holy Spirit kept prompting, but this isn't what's supposed to work. And so I went in and shut myself in. And if you know me, I love leadership. I love those aspects. Nehemiah is probably one of my favorite books. Uh, when we talk about Nehemiah and the way Nehemiah rebuilt, I see the world today. I don't know if you do Facebook, but if you saw my post today, I was serious about what I posted. If you're not in, in Ukraine in a war zone, and you are not in ba Gulf and Bay County in a fire zone, you need to be in church. I, I'm, I'm just not going to beat around the bush about it. We, we have become lazy in gathering ourselves together. You can, you can worship God, and I understand there's people that can't make it, and please understand us. We love you. We understand. Hey, Amy, send love out to that grandbaby. Um, we, we understand all of that. But if you are doing it out of a habit that has become easy, there's nothing you can get at home greater than what is here. Now, you can touch God there, but there's something about corporate worship that was happening in this place. There is something about that. So just hear me today as I talk about this. In the situation our world is in, we should be running to the house of God. I understand we are the temple. I understand that. I understand that we are that, but there, he, there is something about the house of God in us coming. So I want to urge you today, lay aside your excuses, pick up your determination, and come and worship with us in the house of God. Amen. I love you. We're going to be learning from the lessons of Nehemiah. Some people go, Pastor, they're not going to come back. That's, that's not on me. That, that's not on me. Uh, that's between you and God. Uh, our job is to make it available. Anyone notice the cost of uh, construction going up? Man, we've been buying stuff for these teams, and we're like, shut up. It's going to take how long to get this? Weeks for a door? You're kidding. You know, uh, I heard someone the other day make mention, you know, the, the rusty wire that goes in concrete that you put down? Someone told me the other day that it was up in some areas like $400 a roll. You start looking at all of this stuff. Construction prices are up. Material prices are still, still severely elevated, and they're going to fluctuate in 2022. The Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates that construction material prices were up overall by almost 25% in 2021, and we're going to see an escalation in that. Jake, if you don't mind, if you'll turn that fan off back here. I did that, and now I'm hanging meat up here. Today's home builder, Danny Lipford, he was here and did the pocket part uh, for us, but Danny Lipford in uh, today's home builder, January 2022, es says this, experts forecast lumber prices to continue to rise well into 22, 2022 following supply shortages resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Lumber prices have nearly tripled in the last four months, causing the national price of a single-family home to increase by more than $18,600, according to the National Association of Home Builders. You say, Pastor, is this a lesson in construction? Hold on with me. The price of framing lumber topped $1,000 per thousand board feet on December 29. That's a 167% increase since late August. According to Random Links, an organization that provides price assessments for the wood in the products industry. It's interesting to me how we notice the cost of things rising all around us. Food, fuel, fun. But have we put the same thought in the rising cost in today's world of being a disciple for Christ. We talk about how many of you noticed gas prices today. I saw someone, I think it was Courtney, made mention that as she was driving, she saw gas increase 50 cent 
in, a, in an area. We're watching this. We're seeing this. It impacts everything we're doing. It, it's not just about gas prices. Gas, you have, you have a pipe. You have everything that is a byproduct of all of this. But we, we think about that and we, we focus on that a lot. But have we backed up and said, what is the cost of being an, a disciple for Christ in the environment and the time and the season that we're in? If we've ever seen the last days leading up to the return of Jesus Christ, we're seeing them. You say, preacher, I've heard that all my life. Then you're that much closer. That's why I plead with you. Stay connected to the house of God. Don't allow the enemy to get you distracted. See, people in other countries understand the cost of discipleship far better than we do. The underground church today in Ukraine, next Sunday I'll show you some video footage, and we're going to actually do a special offering for fire Bibles that will go in the Ukrainian language to them as they begin to rebuild. Because here's what we know, persecution if we are real people of God, persecution will not destroy the church. The church will grow. And during this season that we're in, seeing all of these things, I want to tell you the time for you to grow in Christ is now. The time for you to read your Bible, the time for you to pray is now. There is a cost for discipleship. We look at people like Stephen, martyred for the cause of Christ. Saul standing there holding his garments, but yet the persecution that he went through impacted this man by the name of Saul who became the Apostle Paul who we now read scripture after scripture. I'm here to tell you the way you handle persecution impacts somebody else for the cause of Christ. The Christian Post, January uh, 16, 2017, 2017. Over 900,000 Christians have been martyred in the last 10 years. A Christian research uh, firm affiliated with Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in Massachusetts estimates. Gordon Conwell Center for the Study of Global Christianity recently released its annual report on the persecution of Christians, which found that as many as 90,000 Christians died for their faith in 2017, just that year alone it has astronomically increased. Although the study was released finding that 90,000 Christians or one Christian every six minutes were killed in 2016, we realize that that is happening at much more. You see, one of the things that we understand is this. In an email about this crisis that is going on, the explanation of the definition of a martyr that was used for that had two qualifying factors. A martyr is that the slain Christian must have been in a situation of witness or have been killed as a result of hostility against them in the cause for Christ. So these are not abstract numbers. You see, here's, here's my reason for telling you we need to be in the house of God together. We need to be in these places. We need to quit making excuses. I know that church now says, you know, just come in, feel good, go away. That, that's over. We've got to get determined about propagating the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and seeing people saved. One of the things I'm excited about today is uh, Pastor Chris isn't able to be with us. Thank you, Corey, and your family for, uh, for the investment that you're making with uh, Pastor Chris being away. Pastor Chris is in Louisiana right now because we believe that we are to help the hurting recover in every area. How many of you today would say, I have a hurt? Come on, every, I think that's everybody. There's healing in Jesus. One of the things that we are excited about is Pastor Chris is now in Louisiana. One of the dreams that we've had for years and years is that there would be a, a men's recovery center here in Mariana. Pastor Chris is there today for the next two weeks talking 
with a group of people that are wanting to come in. Contracts are in the work, everything. And it looks like the facility and everything within the next, within this year, will begin to happen. Come on, that's a reason to celebrate. I told the individual work we're working with, I said, I don't have the money to run it, but we have sweat equity like you would never believe. Why am I saying that? Because you say, Pastor, I don't know how to witness to someone that is being persecuted. The greatest witness that you can do is as you're painting a wall or as you're cutting grass over there or as you're picking up stuff saying, Father, whoever walks through this door in the name of Jesus Christ, I plead the blood of Jesus over them as I'm picking up a piece of paper. Father, in the name of Jesus, whoever walks in this path that I am standing right now by the power of the Holy Spirit, overtake them and may they be healed from the addiction that they are living in and the hurts and may they become a new disciple of Jesus Christ to go out and tell others what Christ has done for them. You should be excited about that. You see, these people understand. When I talk about a martyr, they understand the cost, the price to be paid that was involved for the investment that they're going to make. One of the things that I've been working on is, is getting ready for something that we're, uh, that we're going to call a, uh, a group of people, and my, my mind just went blank. Dana, if you could... Legacy team. We're putting together a legacy team. Thank you. So Dana has uh, helped keep me straight in a lot of areas. We're going to be putting together a legacy team. That legacy team is people who really want to invest above their regular tithe and offering. You see, if you take your tithe and your offering and make it into a different investment, what you do is you, then you make the church struggle. Are you, are you understanding my math? Because your tithe and offering comes into the church, to the storehouse. If you want to make a legacy investment, then that is going to be above and beyond that for a cause that we see that is greater than, than uh, what we could imagine in our own. We're putting together some of this, and I've been, one of the things that I've been looking at is if you're in business, you understand what an ROI is. An ROI is a return on investment. A return on investment is a performance measure used to evaluate the efficiency or the profitability of an investment or compare the efficiency of a number of different investments. An ROI tries to directly measure the amount of return on a particular investment relative to the investment's cost. While the ROI indicator is great for business, there is another indicator that I believe that we as the children of God need to understand. And that is an E-R-O-I. Now, if you look that up on Google, that's going to come back as an energy return on investment. And it talks about the cost of doing and, and making energy. But I believe that we as the children of God need to look at it like this. An ROI is a regular return on investment. But we as the children of God need to be working off of an EROI, which is an eternal return on investment. You see, too many times we get locked into a model. <clears throat> and I'm telling you today, there are people dying and going to hell all over the world, and we need to understand the eternal return on investment. Why are you telling us all of this, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. I would like to submit to you today that as we look at Nehemiah, we are going to understand some principles for an eternal return on investment. Listen to this statement. Like large doors, life-changing events can swing on very small hinges. Like large doors... Great life-changing events can swing on very small hinges. When I think about the building and the rebuilding process, when I think about what's going on in the economy, when I think about what people are doing all over the world in discipleship, when I think about the re eternal return on investment, I always go back and I look at the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a regular guy just like we are. 
We read, well, there's a whole book written about Nehemiah. He must have been a great prophet. He must have been all of these things. No, Nehemiah was a regular guy, just like you and I. But something happened in his life, and he realized, I need to look at an eternal return on my investment. You see, Nehemiah has spoken to my life for over 22 years. Whenever I I need to go back and focus on leadership, when I need to focus on the direction for the church, I go back and I read Nehemiah because here is an ordinary guy that through the power of God did extraordinary things. If you have your Bible, turn with me today. I'm going to read and I'll pause at certain points. I want to read Nehemiah chapter number 1 out of the English Standard Translation. Here we go. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekalah. Now it happened in the twelfth month of Chislev, in the twentieth year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. So everybody look here. Nehemiah is in his place of work. And all of a sudden his brother and some other men show up. Nehemiah His job was a cupbearer for the king. So it was his job to make sure that the food that the king got didn't kill him. So he would taste the wine that came in. He would taste the food. He would taste all of those things. And if Nehemiah didn't hit the ground and die, then the king could eat. How many of you would like that job? So Nehemiah is doing his job, and all of a sudden his brothers and these men from Judah showed up. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. There had been a number of exiles, and they had come back a number of times, and now Nehemiah is asking. And they said to me, the remnant there in the providence who survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. I would submit to you. We in America are at this place also. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed with fire. What this meant was something that used to give glory to God, something that used to be a landmark, something that used to be a place that gave great comfort is now destroyed. When the walls of a city came down, it was almost like the glory of God had left. And as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants. Confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned, which have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you. Now, Nehemiah is in the king's palace, but he's impacted by what's going on around him. We've acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments and the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember your word that you have commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place I have chosen to make them dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who uh, delight and fear your name and give success in your servant to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Listen how he ends it. Now I was cupbearer to the king. In essence, he said, I have no prestige. I have no money. I have no influence. I'm a cupbearer to the king. You see, when I think about this, when you you open this up, Nehemiah, again, I want you to get it in your head, Nehemiah was just 
like you and I. Nehemiah was not a prophet. Nehemiah was not at that time a preacher. Nehemiah was none of those things. And sometimes we get it stuck in our head that the only people that can do great things for God are people with a title. Everybody look up here. I want to help you today. Today I give you a title. You are a child of God and you are a minister of the gospel. You've got a title. It's not a title really that I gave you. It's a title that the Father gave you. And man, what weight. Oh, the preacher gave me a title. Well, he gave me one too. Crazy. I'm not giving you a title. I am declaring the word of God over you today. You are a child of God and you are a minister of the gospel. And you can make a major difference in this world. Under Nehemiah's leadership in all of these things, the Jews withstood opposition and we're going to see where they came in. You see, I believe it's important for us to understand that when God wants to accomplish a work, he always prepares his workers and puts them in the right places at the right time. You may think that I'm just a team that has come in from Indiana. You are putting God's will for a right time for a right place. You may think that I'm just here today hearing a message. You are in a right place at a right time. It all depends on what we do with the message we receive. If I were to tell you today, when you leave here, you have two hours before gas is going to hit $6 a gallon. What would you do? You would run and fill up. You'd have every can. You'd be like the Beverly Hillbillies, if any of y'all remember them, you know. They had, you know, everything tied to that old truck, you know, going through. You'd look like that with gas cans tied everywhere, you know. You'd have everybody, you'd teach your dog to drag a gas can if you could have extra help, you know, to do it. You would leave here. Why? Because something catastrophic is about to happen and you want to get ahead of the curve. Something great for us and catastrophic for those who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We don't have much time to get filled up, to get out there and tell them that God is the answer, that Jesus Christ is the answer. Prices are going up. The cost of discipleship is going up. I must work while it is day because the night comes where no man can work. Now is the time. We're in a construction zone. We've got to look at an eternal return on investment. How do we do this? What do we learn from Nehemiah, pastor, in this? And next week, man, I wanted to preach part of next week's message into this, and I'm having to really restrain myself. How do we do this? Number one, the first thing Nehemiah did was he got real. He got real. He came back and he did not try and push blame on anything else. He said, we have sinned. He said, we, he said, as soon as I heard these words in verse number three, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of of the people which we have sinned against you. He goes on and says, We have acted very corruptly. We have not kept your commandments, the statutes, the rules of your servant Moses. 
Nehemiah got real. He said the reason there is no progress is because we have sinned. There's a story in the Bible about where Moses was moving the people and they had taken over a city. And, and he told them, he said, don't take anything. And a man by the name of Achan, his family grabbed some things and they hid them in the tent. And there was death and destruction that was going on. They came back and they said, someone tell me what's going on. He goes, I, we've sinned. And there was a price to be paid. I want to tell you today the price for your sin has already been paid. There is, listen to me, I hope this is, I, I can, I'm going to make this about as simplistic as I know how to. Pastor, I don't know how to get past my past. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. You mean you, Pastor? All. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But I want to tell you this. You can walk out of here today. You can release that in the next two seconds as fast as it takes for you to say, Father, forgive me of my sins. David, when he sinned, he went to the Lord and he said, it is against you and you alone that I have sinned. You see, we don't preach much about sin anymore. We don't preach much. We don't talk much. We don't, we don't address this. People go, well, what is sin? Sin is anything that stands between you and God. Anything that keeps pushing you back. You need to address that and allow God to heal you and free you from that. Nehemiah got real, and I believe it's time that as children of God, we get real. The Bible tells us one thing, and I, I just want to bump this real quick. Well, I don't really see anything wrong with this, or I don't really see anything wrong with this. Everybody listen to me. It's not about what you see. It's about how we're impacting those around us, because there is a cost of discipleship. The Bible tells us if you offend your brother, if you harm them in their walk, it would be better for you to take a millstone, hang it around your neck, and go jump in the Chipola River. Well, that's kind of tough, Pastor. It's the Word of God. And sometimes we don't want to accept these things, but I'm here to tell you today the cost of discipleship is going up because God is coming back. And every time that we sense a move of the Spirit of God, the enemy attacks greater than he ever has before. But I believe in the healing power of Jehovah Rapha. I believe, Beverly, for your mother. I believe for my father. I believe for every one of you that is going. Someone, if you're dealing with something in your family today, sickness or something like that, raise your hand. Come on, raise them real high. Today, in the name of Jesus, I believe that you've got an answer coming. You say, Pastor, I don't feel any different. You need to stand on that because, listen to me, I believe the Bible says in the last days he will pour out his spirit on all men. And I'm believing that he's looking for a place to pour. Oh, God, let us be a place you can pour. Oh, God, let us be a place that we get real about what's going on. That we repent from where we are. And we move forward for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must get real. We must remember. Verse 8, he said, remember the word that you commended your servant saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you. You know what he's doing? He's remembering also what God said. You see, I've got to go back in my life and I've got to remember what God has said to me in the past. I've got to remember when it looks like everything is going to fall apart. I've got to remember when it looks like things are not going to make it. I've got to go back and remember the times that God has brought me out. I love it whenever I look at the life of Daniel and they threw him into the pit 
And whenever he was thrown in there, Daniel was not afraid because when he saw that the decree had been signed, that there should be no one lifting up their voice to any other king but that king, he lifted up his voice. The Bible says he went to the window and he opened it as he had in times past. And he cried out and the people came and they said, Daniel's praying to somebody else. And the king said, I've got to do what I said I would do. And he threw him into the pit and the lion's mouths were shut. And we think that is the greatest aspect of it. But let me tell you what the great aspect of that was. Whenever the king, when the time was allotted, the king went and he moved that thing. Somebody listen to me today. The king is about to remove the cover and you are going to come out alive. If you want to call it prophetic or you want to call it whatever, I'm telling you somebody has been struggling. And I'm here to tell you today through the power of the Almighty God that that lid is about to release. And he's going to, you're going to be found alive and giving worship to God. <clears throat> what did he say when he moved that lid back? Oh, Daniel, has your Lord delivered you? I think the king was like, okay, you're going to be smelly up in here. But the king, something activated in the king because Daniel was real. He did what he knew to do. Daniel remembered how God had brought him out before. And when the king, oh, well, Daniel, has your God, at that time it was his God, has your God delivered you? What did Daniel say? Oh, king, live forever. My God has delivered me from the mouth of the lion. And what happened when he came out of there? No longer did the king say, you're God. He turned around to everyone else because your impact, has an, your influence has an eternal impact on others. And he turned around and no longer was it your God. He turned to everybody else and he said, the God of Daniel shall be our God. I'm here to tell you today. As you build for the kingdom of God, somebody listen to me. You may say, oh, pastor, you're a little excited today. I am. Because we have the answer to the problems that's going on in the world. You mean you're going to decrease gas prices? No, but my Bible tells me I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. My God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory. We are the people of God. And we need to start acting like it. He got real. He remembered. Team, if you'll come. The last thing then, there was restoration. Restoration. In verse number 11. He turned around and he said, Oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. And to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. There should be joy in serving God. We shouldn't walk around thinking, oh, he's going to knock me upside the head with something now. No, before knocking you upside the head, we'll wrap our arms around. Now I was a cup. 